Hey guys, welcome to Storytime with Jester. Tonight I'm going to be continuing the saga of Andor and his companions in my novel, The Book of Prophecies. Andor's Journal. Free Day 24, 1230. I have awoken in the ranger camp. It seems that I was found by Valian, as were Hawkeye and Jovan, near death, clinging to our lives in the clearing near the towers. I remember we were attacked by the towers themselves, the gargoyles coming to life, their mighty arms extending out to great distances to strike us down. Valian found no evidence of Eric, Miranda, Marakai, or Xavier, so I can only assume they found a way inside somehow. St. Columba protect them keep them safe until we can once again join them. The priests of Ilamora were kind enough to heal us of our wounds. We must return to the towers immediately. Chapter 36 Eric laid hands on Miranda, who was more in need of his healing powers than the others. His vision was aided by the sunlight that shone through the propped open door at the top of the steps. The whole area was dusty and filled with cobwebs. It's a good thing you found the secret door when you did, Eric thanked Miranda, or we'd all be dead by now. I hope the others are alive, Miranda lamented, not seeing how they could have been. The gargoyles had done a number on the group, pummeling Andor, Jovan, and Hawkeye into the ground and causing several wounds on the others. Eric, that brave knight, would have gone back out there to pull the others to safety had Marakai not told him they weren't there anymore. What had become of them? She could only hope the elves took them. What were those things? Marikai asked in frustration and disbelief in what they had just went through. Nothing we did seemed to have any effect on them. Our weapons, your spells, nothing. I think they are an advanced form of golem, Xavier replied. They seemed to be made of stone, but imbued with a type of invulnerability. How did they do that thing with their arms? Marikai asked. I've never seen stone move like that. I've heard tales of rock creatures that move through the earth like elementals, their bodies becoming fluid when, contra when contacting the earth, Xavier stated. Perhaps this lich we seek is, or was, a druid. So what do we do now? Marikai asked. We can't go back out there, and we can't have a go with the lich in our condition. I can heal us, Eric said, but it would take several weeks before we would be ready to fight a foe such as we are attempting. If only Andor were here. Just outside the radius of carnage stood the trio, healed and f with a full complement of spells. Look, there, Hawkeye said, pointing to the base of one of the pedestals. A door. Did they find a way in? Jovan asked, hopeful. They must have, Andor replied. I don't recall there being a door there before. Well, let's go get them, Hawkeye said as he started forward. Grabbing him by the arm, Andor said, Hold, friend. Did you forget what just happened to us? Or did the elves not heal your noggin all the way? Well, what do you suggest? Hawkeye asked. We can't let them face old skin and bones by themselves. Andor surveyed the area and, after careful thought, finally answered, Run and pray. Miranda pulled a book off the web-filled case and blew the dust off the cover, making sure to be facing away from the others, lest the book be trapped with the magical dust. They had already been careless, setting off several traps on their way to this library. The first was an explosion set off by Andor when he, Jovan, and Hawkeye descended the stairs. The fire from their torch had ignited the methane gas that was present. The resulting fireball almost reached the group. Luckily for them, Marikai had propped open the door when they first found it, allowing fresh air in and the deadly gas out. Then there was the poisonous cloud of gas that filled the first room they came to upon their entering it. If that wasn't enough, Jovan was unable to detect the pit trap in the mist-filled corridor that led to the library, himself falling some sixty feet below. This lich much must like to torture those he captures with a slow death, as there weren't any spikes or acid or any of the normal pit treatments at the bottom. The victim in this case must be expected to die of starvation. 
So now she painstakingly went through each book one by one in hopes of finding something out about their foe, while at the same time not setting off any traps. He's not responding to anything, Andor said out loud about Xavier's condition. I detected not any poison in his system. I attempted to remove his par paralysis to no avail. That's odd, Jovan said, examining the skull of their attacker. What is? Eric asked. Well, besides the creature itself, the fact that its fangs contain no residue of poison whatsoever. It looks like someone ripped open the body of a vampire and yanked out skull and spine, said Marakai. More like a vampiric snake, said Jovan. Which is why I checked Xavier for poison and paralysis, said Andor, frustrated. What sort of evil magic is this, Eric said, equally put off by their dilemma. That's it, exclaimed Andor. Magic. Miranda, can you dispel our magic on our unconscious friend here? I cannot, she responded. Cannot or will not, Merakai asked accusingly. Before she had a chance to respond, Eric came to her rescue. Do not impute upon her that which you have no cause. Merakai started to reply, then thought wise to relent for now. He would keep an eye on their lithe companion. I do not know the spell, Miranda said. Haven't you dispelled magic in the past? Jovan asked, looking at Andor. Aye, I have, Andor said. "'Twas what made the mist in the corridor disappear. "'Wish you would have thought to do that a little sooner,' "'Jovan said with a smile and a wink, "'referring to his tumble in the pit "'and trying to lighten the mood. "'We all need to rest and regain our strength,' Andor said. "'May St. Columba protect us while we do.' "'He went and sat on the stone floor in the corner "'and closed his eyes. "'Miranda took a couple of books "'and, using them for a pillow, laid down herself.' While Andor and Miranda slept, the others took turns keeping watch in pairs. The air still doesn't seem right down here, Jovan said, as if the poison still persists. You are correct, Eric agreed. I feel a strong evil presence to the east. The lich? Perhaps, but I think if it were he, we would all be dead by now. No, I do not think the lich to be what I feel. It is something more. Like when we were in the abyss... It was all around us, suffocating. I did not get this feeling when last we faced a lich. I fear this to be more, much more. In the desert tomb, it was the traps that were nearly our downfall. Yes, the creature was very formidable, and had our spellcasters not been prepared, we would have all perished. And Thorfinn's hammer, Jovan added. Yes, Eric agreed. Kempdod. Eric paused for a moment while reflecting on that encounter. As he did, Jovan thought he heard a sound from the passage. When Eric started to speak again, Jovan hushed him. What is it? Eric asked. Shh! Jovan repeated, putting up his hand in a stop signal. Listen, he whispered. From the passage, a low moan could be heard, faintly, as if someone were in mourning. This was joined by the type that those in pain murmur. The moans had a kind of unearthly quality to them, as if made by those whose souls are trapped, unable to go to the hereafter. This is different, Eric continued, trying to ignore the moans. The traps we've encountered thus far are but a token warning. What lies down that passage? His sentence was cut off by a shriek of horror, as if the moans wanted to be heard, would not be ignored. Is pure evil, Eric finished. After several hours of endless moaning, which unnerved those on watch, Andor and Miranda finally awoke. To everyone's surprise and delight, Xavier began stirring as well, his paralysis gone. Andor cast a silence spell with a radius encompassing Miranda, Xavier, and himself so they could regain their spells through studying and prayer without being bothered by the moaning, but the sound penetrated even that barrier, causing it to take longer than normal. When they were done, Andor cast protections on the party against evil and undead. He finally prayed to his patron saint, asking for protection, guidance, and victory, giving thanks for Xavier. With weapons drawn, holy symbols presented, and spells at the ready, they proceeded slowly down the passage, their way lit by a light spell placed on an unlit torch, courtesy of Eric. As they entered the passage, the moaning continued, but seemed to be all around them. Andor glanced at the wall of the passage and froze in his tracks. Were his eyes playing tricks on him? 
The stones of the wall shifted slightly like the letters in the book of prophecies. He looked away and back at the wall. Normal stone. The moaning seemed to get, to get louder, the cacophony of voices swelling inside of his head. He started to look away and back at his comrades in front of him when it happened again. The stones shifted, becoming almost transparent. Were the gargoyles reaching down this far through the earth to attack them? He could almost see through the stones now, their solidity giving way to an undercurrent of death. He blinked twice, hard, but the ghastly images remained. Andor, what is it? Xavier asked. What are you staring at? Andor did not hear his friend speak, for his mind was transfixed on the sight before him. There within the stone were the remains of, what, people? Animals? Monsters? Monsters, for sure, for this thing was monstrous indeed. Eyeballs staring back at him, some part of a skeletal face, others by themselves, as if painted by a gruesome artist. Bits of bone here and there, some making up a rib cage, others an entire skull. Were bodies buried in the mortar of this castle? Mortar? No, the stone wasn't stone at all, but flesh. Did an eyeball just blink? He could start to make out words from the moaning inside his head. What was being said? Help! Help me! The leering faces were imploring him, pleading with him to free them. A bony hand reached out from the wall and grabbed hold of his robe. On instinct, he recoiled and struck the part of the wall where the hand was with his mace. The entire corridor resounded in a loud wail as if it had been hurt. Almost instantly, magical missiles streaked from the wall at several points, striking Andor. At the same time, swords and daggers appeared all along the wall, slashing and thrusting at him, some finding their mark, others too far away to do any harm. Where he stood, a mace appeared and, as if to return the blow he had given, struck him in his chest. The barrage of attacks left Andor reeling, knocking him to the floor. Not knowing what was happening, but not waiting around to be the next victim, the rest of the group launched a counterattack against the wall. None had the fortune to see the wall as Andor did, so their attacks were at somewhat of a disadvantage, but attack they did. The warriors attacked the wall with their swords while Xavier and Miranda quickly made their way down the passage to the far end. Out of reach of the melee weapons, they attacked best they could without also hitting their companions. With each blow the wall received, it returned some two dozen attacks. When it looked as though the battle was becoming futile, Eric called for a retreat to where the wizards were waiting. With the party safely out of the passage, Xavier let loose with a fireball. He quickly followed with a wall of force right in front of them. The small ball of flame streaked halfway down the corridor where it exploded, engulfing the entire passage in flames, the wall of force protecting he and his comrades. With the walls of the dead safely behind them, they turned their attention to the dark room they sought refuge in. Lit only by the red glow from the dying flames, for Eric had dropped the light torch in the passage, they could make out dim, dimly the contents of the room. There were cobwebs everywhere and a thick layer of dust was on the floor giving the impression that it hadn't been used in centuries. At the far end of the room lay a black coffin. On the northern wall hung a sword sheathed in a bejeweled scabbard. Ready yourselves, Eric said as he advanced slowly toward the coffin, his own bejeweled sword in one hand and a newly lit torch in his shield hand. Is he talking to us or challenging some perceived foe? Merakai whispered to Hawkeye, noticing the odd inflection in his voice. Hawkeye responded with a shrug of his shoulders, but notched an arrow to his bow just in case. As the others were likewise getting prepared for battle, the lid to the coffin slid to the foot and fell to the side, exposing its mauve velvet underside. A pair of bony hands grasped the sides of the coffin and a brown-robed figure sat up two intense dots of red hidden in darkness under its hood. As Eric charged the figure, hoping to send it to the abyss before it could harm the party, a hollow voice, deep and resonating, said but one word, Be gone! With that one utterance, Eric vanished, along with the torch he carried, plunging the rest of the group into total darkness. Chapter 37 
In the blink of an eye, Eric's surroundings changed. No longer was the coffin with its unholy occupant before him, nor were any of his companions behind. The room he was in otherwise looked the same, except for the only exit. The passage was narrower and on the wrong wall. What had happened? Was this some sort of powerful illusion? Andor, he called out. Jovan! No answer. Only silence. Then the faint sound of shuffling down the passage could be heard, getting closer. The stench hit his nostrils before his eyes revealed what he heard, as did the wave of evil that assaulted his senses. Then he saw them, zombies, moving toward him out of the fog that filled the passage. No, not zombies. They were too fast. What was that moving on them? Hanging and crawling out of the sockets of their skulls? Worms. Their rotting flesh seemed to be barely clinging to their bones, which undoubtedly was the cause of the stench, but it was the worms that nearly turned his stomach. Eric used his shield and burning torch to hold them at bay, knowing that as soon as they attacked, the power of his sword would allow him to strike a blow to each of his assailants. The three putrid creatures surrounded him and attacked in unison, with fists flailing. As they did so, several of the sickly green worms jumped from the skulls of their hosts at Eric. Some fell to the ground, but those that landed on Eric's field plate armor attempted to find flesh to burrow into but, no, but to no avail, instead sliding harmlessly down the slick metal. Eric's sword bit into what flesh remained of the creatures, cutting off the arm of one. The severed limb fell to the ground, but the open wound where it once was closed up quickly. He ran another through, its lifeless form crumpling to the ground, but a moment later it slowly rose to fight again. He heard more shuffling in the distance as one by one more creatures stepped out of the misty corridor and into the room. Eric kept battling, but each time he would fell one thinking it dead, it would just get up and continue attacking him. Soon he was surrounded by nearly two dozen of the horrid things, and much of his armor was covered in the worms they carried. How long could he keep this up? Where was his companions? Were they each in their own room doing battle with creatures such as this? Or was he intentionally separated from them and thrust into this never-ending battle? These questions he pondered as his muscles started to ache and his body became fatigued. The creatures started to connect more often with their fists as Eric's reaction slowed. If his friends did not arrive soon, he would not dwell on that thought. With a surge of energy, he pressed his defensive attack and with all he had yelled, Andor! Chapter 38 The creature pointed a finger at Andor and uttered a word under its breath. A thin bolt of lightning shot forth and struck Andor, arcing to each of the others and filling the entire room with electrical energy, knocking each of them to the floor. As the others struggled to get to their feet, Andor called upon the power of St. Columba. With the sudden disappearance of his friend and the group's leader, Andor charged the creature, his magical mace striking it on its skull before it could get off another word. Jovan was but a half step behind him, swinging the sword he had obtained from the last lich they faced. The creature clawed feebly at them before succumbing to their blows. It collapsed in a heap of bones on the floor. Oh, that was easy, Hawkeye said, loosening the tension of his bowstring. Too easy, Andor replied. Just like in the desert. I don't understand, said Merakai. Was this not the lich? You weren't with us in the desert, Andor answered. But surely you haven't forgotten the one we faced in the Underdark. Liches aren't pushovers. In the desert, the real lich had created a false tomb and set a guardian to fool those looking for him to believe the guardian was he. I wouldn't exactly say this creature was a pushover, Xavier said. What happened to Eric? Taking out a prism and holding it up to his eye, Andor replied, Let's see if that can be answered right now. Andor started peering around the room through the prism in hopes Eric was being masked by some powerful illusion. Miranda stepped aside, making sure she wasn't in Andor's purview as he did so. When his gaze fell upon the wall containing the bejeweled sword, Andor gave a gasp. What is it? Merakai asked. Everyone back at the entrance, Andor commanded. Xavier, do you have another fireball? Andor, Merakai asked again. What is it? Another wall of the unliving, Andor replied. As Andor turned to join the others at the entrance, he heard his name, faintly. Wait! Andor urged Xavier. Listen. There it was again. 
someone calling Andor's name. Eric, Mirandor, Miranda said, hearing what Andor had. Getting as close to the wall as he dare, Andor yelled, Eric, where are you? He hoped, nay, prayed, that Eric was not somehow a part of the wall. Other side, Eric returned. Need your help, quickly. Andor, hurrying back to the entrance, commanded, Now, Xavier, give it all you have. Xavier took his staff, aimed it at the wall, and spoke a command word. A pea-sized ball of fire streaked out from it and hit the wall dead center, exploding in an enormous ball of flame. He quickly used the staff again to create a shimmering globe around him, which also protected those behind him. He continued firing fireball after fireball until the entire wall of flesh was nothing but ash. The resulting smell was so nauseating that Miranda passed out. Several of the others had to struggle not to vomit the contents of their stomachs. There on the other side was Eric, battling the worm-filled creatures. Light them up, Xavier, Eric yelled. They're like trolls. Keep getting up when killed. Get out of there, yelled Xavier. Then, sensing the urgency, he said, Oh, never mind. Encapsulate. With a wave of his hand, the, his fingers, fingers closing into a fist as he did so, Eric was enclosed in a shimmering globe of force. Xavier then pointed a staff at Eric and let loose a fireball. The pea-sized globe of fire struck the force field surrounding Eric and exploded, engulfing the worm creatures in flames. They writhed and flailed, the worms popping under the intensity of the heat or bursting into flames like an overcooked sausage. Andor walked over to the pile of ash that was the wall of the unliving and retrieved the bejeweled sword. He went up to Eric and handed it to him. What is this? Eric asked, puzzled. A sword, Andor replied, completely stone-faced. I can tell it's a sword, Eric started. While using my prism to scan the room, not only did it reveal the wall for what it was, but I saw a coat of arms lodged in it, Andor, Andor paused, and then continued with a raised eyebrow from Eric. Your, your coat of arms, he said. My, Eric started to say, confused. Well, not yours, Andor interrupted, but like yours, the owl. It was with a corpse who was grasping the sword. I think it was a knight, Eric. The gravity of what Andor was saying was slow to set in, but set in it did, and hard. Eric realized the wall contained the corpses and body parts of a holy knight and probably his entire retinue. Filled with horror that quickly turned to anger, Eric started to blindly seek out the wall's creator, or who he assumed was the one to blame, the Lich. Andor, however, halted him. He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls, Andor said to Eric. You need healing, my friend. We, gesturing to the entire group, need healing. Let the power of St. Columba restore us to full health. Then we will seek out this abhorrence and put an end to its existence. Then, making eye contact with Eric, he added, with level heads. After healing the group of their wounds, Andor used his prism again to scan the room they were in. That wall isn't there, Andor said, pointing to a 20-foot section of wall to the west. There is a passage, he confirmed. What about that passage, Eric said, pointing to where the worm creatures came from, which was to the north. And the mist. Real, both, Andor answered. Which way, Eric? Jovan asked. Eric closed his eyes and opened his senses. He detected evil coming from only one direction, west. Just in case, Xavier said, thinking out loud. He walked over to the northern misty passage, dropped a small block of granite in the opening, turned away and said, wall, as he made his way back to the group. A stone wall grew in seconds, closing off the passage. Eric strapped the new sword to his waist and drew his own sword. He led the way, entering the western 20-foot wide passage. Marakai, close behind, felt a chill sweep over him as if he was touched by an evil presence. After about twenty feet into the passage, Eric suddenly stopped as Marakai walked past him. Marakai then paused and turned toward the rest of the group, which had stopped behind Eric. What is it? Marakai asked. Some sort of barrier, Eric responded. How so? Marakai asked. You are there and I am here. I don't know. Eric replied, a 
attempting to go forward again unsuccessfully. Jovan, who was behind Eric, also met the same resistance. One by one, the rest of the group tried to advance past Eric to no avail, except Hawkeye, who joined Marikai. What's going on here? Marikai asked, confused. It doesn't appear to like spellcasters too much, Andor surmised. Everyone blocked by the barrier can cast spells. Marikai and Hawkeye cannot. Well then, Hawkeye said, you take care of that shield and we'll head them off. Before Andor could even get off a word of warning, Marikai and Hawkeye turned and started to proceed down the passage. They had no more than taken two steps when they had activated glowing runes on the floor that only Andor had noticed. A wave of force struck them as if they had been hit in the head with something hard, bringing them almost to a state of unconsciousness. Marikai staggered into the wall, dropping his sword and nearly falling to the ground. Hawkeye immediately dropped to his knees, his bow clattering out of reach. While they were still reeling from the effects of the symbol they triggered, the very floor seemed to come to life, sprouting vines and branches which twisted and intertwined all around the pair of warriors, causing the needle-sharp thorns that accompanied the brush to bite into their flesh. Soon a barrier that filled the passage as far as they could see was formed. The slightest movement by Hawkeye caused dozens of the three-inch thorns to sink into him. Marikai fared slightly better, being protected by his metal armor. From down the passage, a voice could be heard, rhythmic and foreign. It started low and steady, and then grew in volume and rapidity. In concert with the voice, a chittering and hissing, accompanied by clicking sounds, arose. What is that? Eric asked. Acadian, responded Miranda, referring to the language the voice was speaking. Insects, Jovan said, knowing what Eric was asking. Hundreds, by the sound of it. As he said that, a mass of insects, as thick as a carpet and spanning the width of the passage, slowly crept towards the two warriors trapped in the wall of thorns. Scorpions, centipedes, spiders, and beetles were among the many biting and stinging creatures that made up the swarming mass. Merikai turned and ran through the thorn wall, his armor sustaining most of the damage his body would have received. Hawkeye was not so fortunate. The thorns bit, dug, and slashed at his flesh until his body was but a mass of blood. His movements slowed as his body weakened, allowing the swarm of insects to get ever so close to him. Xavier tried to dispel the magic he assumed held the invisible barrier in place. Much to his chagrin, it had no effect. The group could only watch in horror as the mass of creatures overtook Haw Hawkeye, covering his bloody body until he disappeared beneath them. He was too weak from the loss of blood to even scream out in the agony the insects inflicted on his already tortured body. Marikai was already the, with the rest of the group when the swarm passed over Hawkeye's lifeless body and continued on towards them. As if on instinct, Eric drew the new sword from its scabbard and held it out in front of him, letting his other sword fall to the ground. The new sword began to glow blue immediately, its radiance expanding outwards in a hemisphere. When it contacted the invisible barrier, a burst of energy caused sparks to fly in all directions. Xavier, seething with anger at what he just watched, outstretched his staff and unleashed a wall of fire that engulfed not only the insects, but the wall of thorns and Hawkeye as well. What are you doing? Miranda screamed at Xavier, seeing Hawkeye's body being burned. He ignored her and continued to concentrate on the wall until he was sure the swarm and thorns were destroyed. A haunting laugh echoed through the corridor, taunting the group. As soon as Xavier dispelled the wall of fire, Marikai charged down the corridor, Eric right behind him. The rest of the group quickly followed, readying weapons and spells. Marikai barely saw the lich as he rounded the corner. It uttered but two words in a language Marikai didn't understand. Eric came around the corner just in time to witness Marikai disappear. As the rest of the group entered the room, Eric stood frozen in shock. The lich was horrifying to behold. Its tattered reddish-brown robes hung loosely off its grayed form. Its body was no more than a husk, its head bathed in black fire, its yellow eyes like beacons shining through. It put forth an outstretched bony hand, which closed into a fist as it spoke in Acadian again. The group started gasping for air as the breath seemed to be sucking out of them. Eric, despite not being able to breathe, rushed the lich his new sword glowing bright blue. 
Jovan and Andor took up flanking positions, wielding sword and mace respectively. A shimmering globe formed around Xavier, and multiple images of Miranda sprung into being around her. The lich flung a packet of black dust in the air it had been holding in its other hand. Darkness started to form over Eric's eyes, but he resisted the powder's effects. Andor and Jovan were not so lucky. They both halted their attacks, their sight being impaired. Eric, distracted by the powder and still struggling to breathe, missed the lich with his sword. He recovered quickly, though, and did not miss on his next two swings. The lich, however, was completely unaffected. Instead, both Jovan and Andor yelled in pain, wounds opening up on their bodies where Eric's sword had struck the lich. Xavier pointed his staff at the lich and spoke the command word between gasps for air. Four missiles, shaped like a serpent, streaked toward the lich and struck it. Instead of doing damage to the lich, they rebounded and struck everyone else except Eric. Miranda, having pulled a red agate from one of her pockets, spoke the command word and a ball of flame appeared in the palm of her hand. She hurled it at the lich just prior to being struck by one of Xavier's deflected missiles. The orb of flame struck the lich and encapsulated it. The lich just stared at Miranda and spoke to her in Acadian. Your feeble spells have no power. You are weak, pathetic. You pretend to be a mage? I will show you what a true mage is. The flames from Miranda's orb of fire dissipated without effect, not even a singe on the lich's rags. The lich performed an action as if it were hurling something at Miranda. Suddenly, Miranda was surrounded by black and white energy, crackling and humming. Eric sheathed the sword and took up his mace. He swung it at the lich, striking it on the chest. The lich staggered back in pain. Xavier, unfazed by his rebounding missile due to the globe of protection surrounding him, resorted to a spell of his own making. With both hands, he made wavy gestures in the air as if constructing something and then hurled the unseen object at the lich while shouting, Clamp it shut! He didn't have to shout, but he was tired of hearing the lich speak. Suddenly, a piece of metal formed over the lich's mouth, preventing the creature from speaking and thus casting spells. That did not deter the lich, however, as it put forth its hand and a staff that had been resting in a corner sprung into his grasp. As Eric closed on the lich to strike again, the lich struck first with the staff. A wound opened up on Eric's arm as if he had been struck with a sword. Eric still managed to score a hit with his mace on the lich, wincing through the pain. The dark veil lifted from Andor's eyes and he wasted no time in attacking the lich. He connected with his own mace, it crackling with white energy as it, as it struck the lich on its side. The lich directed its attacks now on Andor, realizing what the mace Andor wielded could do. Eric used this opportunity to drive home his own attacks, pounding the lich hit after hit with his mace, the lich unable to stave off both he and Andor. The lich reached out a hand and touched Eric. Black flame erupted from where Eric had been touched, paralyzing him. The lich then turned toward Andor, where he was met with a mace to the skull. Again, the mace crackled with energy, but this time the lich was unable to withstand the magic contained within. The lich shuddered and convulsed and seemed to explode, as was the usual occurrence of any undead succumbing to the magic of Andor's mace. Where the body of the lich stood moments ago, however, was now fiery black energy loosely in the shape of a humanoid. Before anyone could react, the energy flowed through a five-foot-tall standing mirror in the corner of the room. Eric, remembering the failed encounter with the Spider Queen, started to run toward the mirror when he was halted by Xavier's voice. Wait! Xavier shouted. He strode up to Jovan, who was just now beginning to see again, opened up the pack on his back, and pulled out a blanket. He walked over to the mirror and covered it up with the blanket, then cast a spell to dispel magic on it in hopes of breaking the ties it had with the lich. Why did you stop me? Eric asked, furious. Andor, the closest in proximity to his friend, touched him on the arm and said, Xavier is wise in what he has done. We do not know what, where that mirror leads. Unlike the Spider Queen, our mission here is only to retrieve the relic and bring it safely back to those that can cause it to heal the people of the forest. My mace should have blasted that thing out of existence, but it did not. I am not sure why that is so, but that is not for us to know right now. Let us gather what we can here and head back to the encampment. 
Many lives are counting on us. Eric knew Andor spoke wisdom, but fumed with hurt pride at letting now the second evil being to escape, and by the same method. Attempting to debate against wisdom that he knew to be right, Eric said, What about Merakai? What if he is on the other side of that mirror? What if that is our only way of saving him? Those are big ifs, my friend, Andor replied. If it is the will of St. Columba, we will see Merakai once again. If not, then he died fighting for those in the forest who can't help themselves. Right now, I must do what I can for Hawkeye. May St. Columba give me the power to bring him back. As Eric stood there like a knight dejected, Andor went over to the burnt corpse of Hawkeye while the others began searching the room. The wild energy that had surrounded Miranda was no longer there. Andor knelt down beside Hawkeye and began praying. He wasn't sure how to proceed. He knew from experience that should he raise Hawkeye from the dead with poison in his body, and there was sure to be an enormous amount of present, that upon Hawkeye's return from the dead, the poison would just kill him again. Even if he successfully neutralized the poison first and then brought him back to life, his body would be horrifically scarred thanks to Xavier's ill-timed and placed fireball. He decided that the best shot he had was to resurrect his body. This would restore him as he was, pr as he was prior to his death. Praise be to St. Columba that he had a scroll containing one of those spells, for he did not know if he was strong enough to attempt such a feat on his own. He pulled the scroll containing the spell from his satchel, thanked St. Columba for the priest who gave up years of his life in order to transcribe the spell onto the parchment, gave thanks for allowing him to be the possessor of such a scroll in his hour of need, and prayed for the favor of St. Columba in restoring Hawkeye to life. He then unrolled the scroll and began reading the spell. Dust started swirling around Hawkeye's body as the wounds suffered by the insects and fireball began to disappear. After several minutes, the dust settled back on the ground and Hawkeye began moving. After a full ten minutes had passed, Hawkeye was up and speaking, back to his jovial self as if nothing had befallen him. He was quickly surrounded by all of his comrades, being the recipient of hugs and other well-wish embraces. In a chest in the corner of the room, they found the cup and talisman they were seeking, and a fortune in coins. Where the lich last stood, lying on the floor, were an amulet, ring, gem, and a pouch holding packets of the black powder. Andor's Journal Sunday, 25 1230. We linked back up with Valian, who escorted us back to the ranger camp, where we will begin healing the good people of the forest of their dreaded disease. Xavier teleported himself and the mirror to his tower in Marladron. He will rejoin us shortly. God's Day, 25, 1230. It appears that the relics only have the power to heal one person per day. Also, we've discovered a serious drawback to its use. It ages the priest using its powers of healing about ten years, each use. Valian has sent out word for all possible healers to come to our aid as soon as possible. And that, my friends, is where we will end for tonight. I hope you enjoyed tonight's reading as much as I enjoyed reading it to you. Please join me again next week as the saga continues and we pick up at chapter 39. Make sure you hit the like button, the subscribe to the channel, and hit that little bell notification so that uh, you can get notification of when I post new videos. Uh, not only these Wednesday night, Wednesday night readings, but also my Sunday morning review of D&D products. Also, um, as I've mentioned in recently in my um, Sunday morning uh, broadcasts, that um, I don't I don't have Patreon, Patreon or, or however it's pronounced, uh, or any any tip jar thingy like that uh, that other broadcasters uh, have available on their channel. So. Um, if you wish to support me in such a fashion, um, what I would prefer you all do is um, go to the About 
section on my channel here, or you can go to my Facebook page, James Richmond Author, uh, to the About section there, and either one of these About sections will uh, give you links to purchase the book that I'm reading, The Book of Prophecies. It is available in hardpack, hardback, paperback, and ebook formats. Uh, all three links are provided in the About sections, and uh, that will help me greatly in continuing to put out uh, content like this. Well, I do appreciate everybody watching, and uh, until next time, and as always, see you soon.